Hello Proponomics people and welcome to the supplement from the 26th of November 2023. This one is the autumn statement take down break down. So as you know I like to start off with a quote and this week's is the music industry is a world of smoke and mirrors. They tell you exactly what they think they want you to hear and they are barefaced lying and that's from Khalees the music artist. The point is the same applies to politics and economics. So there's only five days to go as I'm recording this till the Pip Christmas party. The last few tickets are available on the website. It's in Solihull Friday, December the 1st, 2023. It would be great to see you there if you haven't already booked. So it's another juicy week on the back of last week's, the 2024 and the impending election starts to heat up. Did you know that next year is the busiest for elections in the Western nations around the world for 60 years? I'm assuming the incumbents don't go for the fingernails approach and have the election in January 2025. I'm going to whiz through the macro roundup before getting into a good trademark line by line of the statement, although only for the exec summary. The full document is over 110 pages, so I won't put everyone through that. Labour productivity was down 0.2% quarter on quarter in the initial figures. This is perhaps no surprise since wages are above price inflation and it's a simple case of the denominator going up more than the numerator is. No more or less than that. Expect more of this given what's in the budget. And the flash, which is the real-time purchasing managers indices, the PMIs, were also out this week. And it seems these were the event, rather than the budget, to reverse the recent great progress made in the bond markets. I had spoken of the journey under 4% on the five-year gilt and the resistance level, and that was shattered on Thursday rather than Wednesday, even though my feeling was the statement was the event that shattered it and shattered hopes of conquering inflation, which were rife only last week after the great news around CPI from October, which I broke down into its component parts in last week's supplement. The five-year closed the week at 4.18%, an advance of 20 basis points on the back of the services PMI returning to 50+, plus, which is growth territory, suggesting that services inflation has no particular event to temper its aggressive year-on-year -year growth. The manufacturing PMI was also well above forecasts, meaning that the path is a return to growth from the PMI perspective, just about, after three months of the composite index being well below 50. This is very similar to the US path around 10 to 11 months ago, and the US has returned to steady growth after that particular wobble. All this adds up with the delayed cycle imposed by slower monetary policy activity and overall a much less aggressive approach to economic issues than our friends across the pond. In short, good for the economy, bad for rates. Higher for longer scores another tally in the chart. The bond bears were back with a vengeance and as I said last week, reasons to be under 4% on the five-year guilt were limited at this time. The treacle continues. The Governor of the Bank of England, Andrew Bailey, also addressed the National Farmers Union this week and I had a look at the speech. Bailey highlighted that supermarkets assured us that prices were coming back down on food well before they actually were and that farmers had pointed out that energy, fuel, fertiliser, feed haulage and labour were all increasing in cost significantly and they were more sceptical and they were proven to be correct. It made me think about those farmer related inputs to energy, fuel, insurance, materials and labour and switching those over to the property market and the impact on rents that there has been in the PRS and across the board of course. Consumer prices and agricultural prices have moved together mostly Although in recent years, consumer prices have raced away somewhat as incomes allowed people to afford more than the essentials. Food is about 12% or so of the consumption basket that's used to measure inflation, compared to over 36% of the basket in 1950. Alcohol and tobacco is also down from 17.5% of the basket to 4% today. That's some social shift. That 12% of course breaks down by decile. The poorest 10% spend 27% of their income on food, compared to 6% for the richest 10%. That perhaps won't be too much of a surprise, but I thought it highlighted the disparity well, since it's the one staple other than energy and shelter, which often go together of course. 
It's also nice to know that even the poorest 10% only spend 75% of the income that the average person did in the 1950s on food, putting things into historical context. Bailey finished the speech with a very clear message though. Let me be very clear, it is far too early to be thinking about rate cuts. And he didn't even know what was in the budget, or, or did he? I mean, you'd think he'd have a reasonable brief, but the speech was delivered on Monday, but likely written a fair while before that. Anyway, about that budget, I did exclaim a couple of times whilst watching the speech live in the office, liar. The twisting of the facts was at its very best. And as someone who has voted across the board and who's likely poorer in face of a Labour government, I'd like to think I'm relatively non-partisan. I certainly called Rayner an idiot this week when she announced day one banning of Section 21 and speculated there could be 50,000 Section 21s or more served in the run-up to the election as soon as a date is announced. Here is the exact summary with emphasis on my comments. I'll put emphasis on this for the listeners. So in January 2023, the Prime Minister set out three economic priorities to halve inflation, grow the economy and reduce debt. I thought this was a clever way of ignoring the other two that are absolutely floundering, but also fair enough since this is about the economy. CPI inflation has now more than halved from a peak of over 11% last autumn to 4.6% in October 2023. Obviously, I've done this subject to death, but this is factually accurate. The economy has recovered from the pandemic more quickly than first thought, grown more than expected this year, and is forecast to grow in every year of the forecast period. Hmm, expected by who? The OBR, the Office for Budgetary Responsibility, who produced the forecast that the Treasury uses? Sure, although their March report was torn a new one by me in the supplement at the time, as it was clear hogwash. Underlying debt is forecast to fall as a proportion of GDP from 2027 to 28 and the government has greater headroom against its fiscal rules than at spring budget 2023. The bad news is that's always the forecast. It'll be all right in the future. The 2023 forecast was also incredibly bearish, and unnecessarily so, as I said at the time. So there's no surprise it wasn't as bad as published back then. A lot of this also was based on the fact that, ultimately, they had inflation coming down at a ridiculous pace, which was never realistic, as I also said at the time. And that greater amount of inflation has simply put more money in the government coffers. Back to Hunt, anyway. The government must continue to bear down on inflation, and the Office for Budget Responsibility forecasts that government policies in the autumn statement will reduce inflation next year. Now, I need to take the first of the opportunities to say that the government blame the Bank of England wherever they can, and have also absolutely not tried to continue to bear down on inflation via fiscal policy, which they do control, the levers of taxes and the likes in this budget, not at all. With inflation falling and the economy and public finances stabilised after a series of unprecedented shocks, the government can now take the long-term decisions necessary to strengthen the economy and build a brighter future. That's probably fair, although I'm sure the next unprecedented shock is just around the corner, of course. The government is focusing on five areas. Reducing debt, cutting tax and rewarding hard work, backing British business, building domestic and sustainable energy, and delivering world-class education. The fifth one is particularly difficult to swallow. The spend is not what it needs to be to get anywhere near world-class education any time before university. The rest makes good reading, or a good soundbite, and of course is different from Sunak's five priorities from last year, which are now going to melt away into the dust, they hope. The autumn statement takes a responsible approach to public spending to keep debt falling, cuts taxes for working people and businesses, reforms welfare to help people into work and removes barriers to business investment to boost growth. Particularly those who lean right, but I'm sure the majority are supportive of this approach. The OBR estimates that government decisions at the autumn statement will boost business investment by £14 billion and bring a further 78,000 into employment by the end of the forecast period. The £14 billion is frankly pocket change compared to GDP, although of course we'd rather have it than not but underinvestment has been horrific over the past decade or so. Some was inevitable because of the great financial crisis, but a lot was also caused by quantitative easing. The 78,000 jobs are not trivial, of course, and that's great for a forecast from an outfit who have not proven themselves to be the best forecasters of late, but never mind. 
This means that the combined impacts of the spring and autumn policy measures will increase the number of people in work by around 200,000 by the end of the forecast. Let's hope so. Together, autumn statement policies are forecast to increase the economy's potential output in the medium term by 0.3%. This is in addition to a 0.2% increase to potential GDP, resulting from announcements at Spring Budget 2023. Although those look fairly tiddly, these are massive numbers. That would be £100 billion or more per year. These are the two largest increases to labour supply and potential GDP resulting from fiscal policy the OBR has ever scored in a medium-term forecast. This whole thing feels like the opposite of Truss and Quarting. Quarting literally gave the OBR the cold shoulder, where it feels like Hunt's Treasury have almost cooked the books with them. Let's hope it's better than that, and I'm being overly cynical. Anyway, reducing debt. Reducing debt and borrowing is essential to controlling inflation, keeping mortgage rates affordable and funding public services sustainably. I don't really believe this is true at all. In fact, inflating the debt away, the best of a bad bunch, is secretly what's going on here in stages, let's face it. After accounting for decisions at the autumn statement, borrowing is forecast to be lower this year, next year and on average over the forecast, compared with the OBR's March forecast. That's a bit like playing a bit better than when you lost 8-0 in the last game. The March forecast was so miserable. Underlying debt is also lower as a percentage of GDP by an average of 2.1 percentage points across the forecast. Putting this into context, this is a couple of percent on debt of 100% of GDP. The government is on track to meet its debt and borrowing fiscal rules with greater headroom against both rules than in the spring. As before, this is no surprise. Underlying debt begins to fall from 2027 to 28, and then falls to 92.8% of GDP in the target year, which is 2028-29. The debt rule is met with £13 billion worth of headroom, double the £6.5 billion headroom in spring. The borrowing rule is met three years ahead of target, and with £61.5 billion headroom, an increase of £22.3 billion since the spring. More of the same. It's going in the right direction, though, for a change. The government has taken difficult but necessary decisions to get debt falling and ensure our public services continue to operate effectively in the face of financial and operational pressures. I'm not sure this is really true. They've controlled wages this year, but guaranteed another fight next year with the way they've negotiated. It's almost as if they always had a plan here. The Autumn Statement reaffirms the commitments made at Autumn Statement 2022 to make available up to £14.1 billion for the NHS and adult social care and provide an additional £2 billion for schools in both 2023-24 and 2024-25. Although he's not clear here, this suggests these rises are in real terms, i.e. after inflation. Total departmental spending will be £85 billion higher in real terms by 2028-29 than at the start of this parliament, 2019 to 20. As a proportion of income, households on the lowest incomes have benefited the most from government decisions on tax, welfare and public spending since autumn statement 2022. Well, I think it would be fairer to say they've been the biggest comparative beneficiaries, bearing in mind that nearly everyone is actually worse off in real terms than they were since autumn statement 2022. Tackling waste and inefficiency has always been at the heart of the government's approach to public spending, but high inflation continues to put additional pressure on departmental budgets. The real cuts needed after the pandemic bloating simply have not been approached with the correct vigour, mostly because of a big Boris, big government legacy and a lack of appetite to do it while strikes are plentiful. The government has therefore driven even greater efficiencies than those assumed at Spending Review 2021 to manage down these pressures and ensure departments can live within their settlements and deliver the service outcomes that the public expect. I think we'd need some pretty hardcore evidence of this to buy into this statement. The government continues to tackle tax non-compliance and is introducing the largest package of measures since 2016. This is forecast to raise an additional £5 billion of tax revenue over the next five years, which would otherwise have gone unpaid to fund vital public services. Or, my take on it might be, fraud has been rife during and after the pandemic and HMRC now have come to some capacity and we can try and sort it. Let's see. 
While day-to-day spending will continue to grow above inflation in future years, public spending faces many pressures. The government must get the most out of every pound of taxpayers' money by boosting productivity and focusing spending on the government's priorities. The only way to do this is to increase output over and above the rise in input costs and labour costs. The government continues to drive forward the public sector productivity programme to reimagine the way public services are delivered. Hmm, so far in five months since its announcement, the first deliverable has been completed. Better ways of measuring productivity. Five months. Yes, welcome to the public sector. More of a gentle nudge than a drive, I'm sure you'd agree. Cutting tax and rewarding hard work. The government has had to take difficult decisions to restore the stability of the public finances in wake of the economic shocks caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and Putin's illegal invasion of Ukraine. That's all true enough. But with inflation falling, growth more resilient than expected this year and debt forecast to reduce, the government can now return some of that money to taxpayers and ensure people keep more of what they own, earn. They can, or will it just be robbing Peter to pay Paul? or national insurance to pay income tax? If you listen to the speech, you probably already know the answer. The government is cutting taxes for over 29 million working people. The main rate of Class 1 employee national insurance contributions will be cut from 12% to 10% from the 6th of January 2024, with employees benefiting from January onwards. There's, surprisingly, but consistent with Sunak's approach, another benefit for the lower paid, everyone in work but below the higher rate threshold. It should be applauded. I support it, although I think it gives the incumbents very little political capital. But we will find out, of course. This means the average worker on £35,400 will receive a tax cut in 2024-25 of over £450. This will reward work and sustainably grow the economy, providing a combined rate of income tax and NICs for an employee paying the basic rate tax of 30%, the lowest since the 1980s. Now, very rarely do you see an admission that the basic rate of tax is 32% at the moment, not 20%, and will drop to 30%, a fair call. The government is also cutting taxes for the self-employed from the 6th of April 2024. The government is reducing the main rate of Class 4 self-employed NICs from 9% to 8%, and will also abolish the outdated and needlessly complex Class 2 self-employed NICs reforming and simplifying the tax system. I heard this and I thought, I bet they're cutting these because it costs as much to measure and collect them as they actually collect in revenue. Still, even if that is the case, then this is the sort of pragmatic solution that Jeremy Hunt does bring to the table with his business head on. Taken together, these changes will benefit around 2 million self-employed individuals and result in an average self-employed person on £28,200, saving £350 in 2024-2025. These measures are hard to criticise from the people's perspective, but don't get lulled into a false sense of security. Ultimately, the gigantic amount of inflation pushing more people into the tax bans, which remember are frozen until 2028-29, theoretically anyway, make a massive difference to how much tax people are actually paying. And of course, the real value of their income, which has been eroded by inflation. These tax cuts are part of the government's long-term strategy for growing the economy and getting more people into work, ensuring that the UK has the labour market it needs for its future. This is where I screamed liar, I believe. Tax is not being cut overall. It's swelling massively with significant pay rises but frozen tax bans for so many taxes, including personal allowance, higher rate and all the bans above. It is disproportionately helping the lower paid, which is creditable, But Hunt can't quite bring himself to say it like that, of course, because that would upset the right of the party quite significantly. And it would sound quite strange coming from a blue, let's face it. The OBR forecast these changes will increase the number of people in employment by 28,000 by 2028-29, alongside a further substantial economic benefit from those in work increasing their hours. I suspect, again, this is a bit naughty. The average full-time worker is working a few hours less than pre-pandemic, because of mostly pandemic-inspired factors. These are simply expected to correct. The government is delivering on its commitment to end hourly low pay. From the 1st of April 2024, the national living wage will increase by 9.8% to £11.44, with the age threshold lowered from 23 to 21 years old. 
this is gigantic and also dichotomous. The threshold is now very much in the market in terms of interfering with the clearing price for labour. You'd expect more unemployment on top of the cyclical unemployment that's already started to appear on the back of the rate hikes. And also you'd expect this is significantly inflationary. What's the other side of the coin for property investors? Rent affordability will be significantly boosted. Is there a third side of the coin? That would be some strange coin, but I'm afraid there is. If this is inflationary, or certainly less disinflationary, then rates must remain higher for longer in the absence of a recession of significance. This represents an increase of over £1,800 to the annual earnings of a full-time worker on the national living wage, and is expected to benefit over 2.7 million low-paid workers. I suspect this is a significant underestimate, because there will be several million more who are currently paid below £11.44 per hour, who are pegged somewhat to minimum, or will have to get a significant increase either way. I'm guessing they don't have the data, otherwise he would be sure to claim that as well. The government is reforming the welfare system so it better supports people into work where they're able, focusing on the long-term sick and disabled and long-term unemployed. The government's back-to-work plan, supported by over £2.5 billion in funding over the next five years, is an ambitious new programme to help people look for and stay in work, manage their health conditions and stem the flow into sickness-related inactivity. This is funding that would make a limited difference in the NHS, even though that's where the true investment needs to go in order to fix the long-term sickness issues. Waiting lists up, sickness up. No rocket science here, just causation and correlation. There are now a record 2.6 million people who are economically inactive due to long-term sickness and disability, almost half a million more than before the pandemic. Now, interestingly this week, I read a statistic from the South China Morning Post that said around 50% of Hong Kong immigrants, of which there are over 225,000 over the past few years, are economically inactive at the moment, even though they're of working age. Um, most of them complaining about the lack of jobs there are that are suitable for their level of qualification. But of course, they come to the country with significant resources on average, and they don't necessarily need to go straight out to work. So those would have to be considered in the figures apart from anything else. Anyway, back to Hunt. The government is taking steps to reform the fit note process to support more people to resume work after a period of illness and expanding the universal support programme that matches those with health conditions and disabilities into vacancies. This sounds more like traditional Tory rhetoric to me, but I'm also sure the majority would agree that holes in the system have appeared thanks to COVID and many know someone has taken advantage. It's always a thorny subject because a large percentage will be genuine, of course. But overall, I do believe people will behave as they are incentivised. It's something I've observed my entire working life. The government is also expanding the NHS Talking Therapies programme and individual placement and support to help people with mental health conditions. It's been disgusting to me of late that the breathing space rules are seemingly only used abusively to buy time for tenants that are not paying rent intentionally. It's such a shame. We are decades behind on mental health compared to physical health and this should be supported, but not abused. The government will work with employers and business representatives to develop and promote best employment practices to support employees with health and disability issues. The government is reforming the Work Capability Assessment, the WCA, so that more individuals, such as those with limited mobility and mental health conditions, receive the right support to find work where they can, rather than being deemed automatically unable to work or look for work. This sort of chat seems mostly targeted at the traditional Conservative voter. To better help the long-term unemployed into work, the government is expanding additional job centre support, extending and expanding the Restart programme in England and Wales, and strengthening sanctions for those who choose not to engage with measures that help them find work. This is classic vote-winning Conservative chat. And generally, I'm on side, as an aside. In terms of real economic significance, minimal to be generous. For those that cannot work for legitimate reasons, there must always be a safety net. Government will uprate all working age benefits for 2024 to 25 in full by September 23 CPI, inflation of 6.7% and will continue to protect pensioner incomes by maintaining the triple lock and uprating the basic state pension, new state pension and pension credit standard minimum guarantee for 24-25 in line with average earning growth of 8.5%. This was speculated not to happen. But these are the standard obligations in terms of benefits. 
And I, for one, would support them, absolutely, within the context of the existing welfare state, which badly needs reform. The triple lock is a ridiculous policy that will destroy long-term pension viability in the UK, and the sooner it is changed, the better. But this needs to be a cross-bench solution. Inflation in the last few years showed just how ridiculous the triple lock is, but pensioners vote in the greatest numbers and swing elections, and generally vote Conservative, simply because the older you get, the correlation is that the further to the right your views become. Simply unsustainable in the medium and long term and fiscally not conservative at all, which is what annoys me, because I very much tolerate the blues on the basis of fiscal conservatism and very little else. In response to the energy crisis, the government provided one of the largest support packages in Europe. Now this was the one thing that Truss did absolutely correctly, although the thinking had been done for her before she took the helm of course. Why did they have to provide one of the largest support packages in Europe? Pathetic energy strategy since the 1970s. But there you go. To further support low-income households with increasing rent costs, the government will raise local housing allowance rates to the 30th percentile of, lo of local market rents in April 2024. This was expected by many. My opinion of the level of care that the incumbents have for tenants had almost given up on this. However, the terrible state of play, a market where councils, providers and the likes are paying 35% more or more above the LHJ rate in order to get properties because market rents have moved so much, have meant that the money's being spent anyway. And no doubt the bean counters at the Treasury have worked out if they turn around and say, no, the rates have gone up already, there's nothing in budgets above LHA, they'll actually save money, especially as rents are, of course, forecast to race forwards over the next 18 months. Rates will be set in Jan 2024 at the percentile, and I thought they might consider putting the percentile down to the 20th or the 25th, and I'm not sure why they didn't. And the biggest beneficiary is the tenant, who could no longer have any realistic chance at a private sector property on the LHA rate set in January 2020. That's the image I've used this week. And if you look at the legend on there, you can just see how many local authorities have got fewer than 2% of new affordable lets available at LHA rate. The image was prepared by Savills using the VOA data and April 2023's right move rents for new listings which of course have moved on another 5% since then or so. This will benefit 1.6 million low-income households who will be around £800 a year better off on average in 2024-25. We need to be cautious as to better off simply because of inflation. Until the chat is all in real terms, it becomes impossible to trust anything that anybody says. This isn't a direct reflection on Hunt, but he should bear this in mind if integrity matters more than political bluster. Which, of course, to him, it doesn't. Taken together, support to households to help with the high cost of living is worth £104 billion over 2022-23 to 24-25, or £3,700 per household on average. It's a really interesting tactic, you know. People have been squeezed. Not putting up LHA last year was nearly criminal. And overall, will absolutely have cost money, administrations money overall, because of homelessness that will have been a direct result. But people do think on a relative basis with a recency bias. So things will feel better from April 2023. Backing British business. When the economy is growing, there are more jobs, higher wages and increasing living standards. Yep. Since 2010, the UK economy has grown the third fastest in the G7. Faster than France, Germany, Japan and Italy. This is true. Although, to bring in the previous administrations when Sunak spends most of his time either passively or openly criticising them is interesting and is an effort to paste over the performance since the last election, which is pathetic in comparison to the G7, joint last with Germany, and only two of the seven to be smaller in real terms as to Q1 2023. And we've hardly torn it up since then, although Germany have done even worse. We do have to bear in mind as well that since then, the figures have also been revised. So that statement will need revisiting. But I can promise you, if 2020, 2019's performance to date was more impressive than 2010's performance to date, he would have used 2019's performance to date. Unprecedented shocks have hit the economy since 2020. But with stability restored, the government is backing British business to drive long-term economic growth. Let's hope that's not just lip service, because it won't come from bloated government, waste and crony capitalism. The government believes the best way to grow the economy is not through higher borrowing and untargeted support, but by creating the conditions for the private sector to thrive by removing barriers to investment 
and cutting taxes for business. Tried and tested Tory rhetoric. Business investment in the UK has been lower than other leading advanced economies at 9.5% of nominal GDP over the past 10 years, compared to 11.2% on average in France, Germany and the US. Addressing this gap is crucial to improving UK productivity and so the government is introducing an ambitious package of measures to unlock business investment. The productivity puzzle does hinge a lot on poor investment, but has been going on for more than a decade. We are on course for two lost decades if you cherry pick 2007 slash 8 as the start point. The UK already has one of the most competitive business tax regimes of any major economy with the lowest headline rate of corporation tax in the G7. It's a bit cheeky after the recent rises, but it's still true. In 2021, the government introduced the super deduction to incentivise business investment. Since then, investment growth has been faster in the UK than any other country in the G7. At spring budget 2023, the government went further, replacing this with full expensing for three years from the 1st of April 2023, allowing businesses to write off the full cost of qualifying plant and machinery equipment. The government is now making this change permanent. Worth over £10 billion a year, full expensing is the biggest business tax cut in modern British history. This isn't really a vote winner, but it is a good move and a good example of the level of engineering and what collaboration with the OBR can do compared to the idiotic effects of last year and Hunt's predecessor. This makes the UK's capital allowances regime one of the most generous in the world and the OBR expect this will unlock an additional £14 billion of investment over the forecast period. This will improve the UK's capital stock, help close the productivity gap and drive sustainable growth. The government is also making changes worth £280 million a year to simplify and improve R&D tax reliefs, helping to drive innovation in the UK. R&D is proven to work very well and provide excellent returns for the government for the cost of the reliefs. Sensible, wise, good work here. The government is removing barriers to investment in critical infrastructure by reforming the planning system to speed up approvals and setting out a plan to reduce the time it takes for new projects to connect to the grid. Ooh, a plan. Great. Did you know that at the moment there's no time constraint when someone has to put in an application for the grid? Think of it like planning. The equivalent would be no three-year commencement rule and then counting every dwelling, dwelling ever granted permission for as units already agreed and then turning down new developments based on planning granted six years ago and as yet undelivered. What a mess. Thankfully, there are major upgrade works happening, but as usual, it's reactive and needs a kick up the backside. Get on with it. Together, these reforms will unlock new commercial developments that will enhance our energy security and help drive the transition to net zero. Quiet on this subject, mostly because of Sunak's recent efforts. Personally, as I've said before, I'd be putting some more money from the defence budget into energy security because they are absolutely the same thing. Energy instability is a massive potential banana skin going forward in a world of geopolitical tensions. The government is announcing a business rate support package worth £4.3 billion over the next five years to support small businesses in the high street. The small business multiplier will be frozen for a fourth consecutive year and retail hospitality and leisure relief will be extended ensuring the most vulnerable businesses continue to be supportive. Have to be supportive of this. Again, as so often, the system is no longer fit for purpose, but the sledgehammer approach is better than hanging these sectors out to dry. Imagine invest investment in these sectors at the moment, though, on its backside, because year-to-year -year decisions are not sufficient. More lobbying and more effort needed here. The standard rate multiplier will be uprated in line with CPI inflation. Ouch. While this will increase business rates bills for some, large retailers are expected to benefit from hundreds of millions of pounds of tax relief per year as a result of full expensing. Small business is feeling it the most, so this does make sense, but expect more high-profile administration cases in, as 2024 comes and goes. Businesses need access to capital to grow and invest in the UK. The autumn statement builds on the Chancellor's Mansion House speech with... A package of measures to reform the pensions market to unlock investment into high growth sectors and generate increased returns for savers. This is interesting. Savings have benefited faster than borrowers are feeling it because very few savers were in long term savings bonds because rates were so low. Thus, the net impact of interest rates at the moment is to provide much more income to those with savings 
generally the older population, which is also generating more tax, of course. This is something I'll be talking about more going forward. Pension unlocking has been a large part of Tory strategy for some time, and it does make sense, but so far it hasn't really seen large degrees of success, sadly. The government continues to back the growth sectors of the future and is announcing further targeted support for digital technology, green industries, life sciences, advanced manufacturing and creative industries. This includes making available £4.5 billion to unlock investment in strategic manufacturing sectors, auto, aerospace, life sciences and clean energy, which are developing cutting-edge technology and driving our transition to net zero. Sad world, isn't it, when £4.5 billion sounds like pocket change, but these sectors obviously need significant investment. Targeted makes sense. It'd be nice to see the evidence. Together with existing manufacturing support and decarbonisation plans, this funding will level up communities across the country with higher paid jobs, improve the UK's energy security and help grow the sectors of the future. I've said it before, net zero and green energy are the great business opportunities of the time. The huge issue for the green lobby and the ideologues is that net zero means growth and new mines, e.g. lithium, whereas the Greens prefer net zero by having no growth, where the UK indigenous population is already at as an aside. But of course, that's because if you introduce a pandemic and a cost of living crisis, people start having fewer babies because they are not stupid. The government is delivering on levelling up and announcing further measures to support growth and investment across the UK, including confirming the next set of, next set of investment zones in Greater Manchester, the West Midlands and the East Midlands, and doubling the flexible funding programme for each investment zone from 80 million to 160 million by extending the programme and associated tax reliefs from five to 10 years. Good news, yet to see anything meaningful on the investment zones, be interested to hear what Andy Burnham and Andy Street have to say, because they're much more truthful than your average cabinet minister in my experience. And it seems to be absolutely no accident that their investment zones, the new investment zones there are in Greater Manchester, West Midlands and the East Midlands. Together with submitted plans for investment in regulated utilities, the autumn statement measures could raise business investment by around 20 billion per year in a decade's time. The long-term decisions taken at the autumn statement keep debt falling, cut taxes and reform welfare to reward hard work and unlock billions of pounds in business investment to drive sustainable growth. Overall, as I've said, I'm very supportive of this surgical approach and decreasing national insurance rather than income tax is very smart, really, if you want to favour workers rather than landlords who save us, who don't pay NI as of right. Not ideal for the landlords, but nonetheless clever. That concludes the statement, and whilst I'd love to tuck into the OBR report, that will have to wait until next week, as I've already likely lost too many listeners by this point, because this week is so very long. Hashtag sorry not sorry. The property specifics deep in the 110 plus pages and their likely impact on the market also need some analysis and will likely take precedent before we get to OBR. And next week will also be the 1st in December, so we'll have some November figures to pour over. There will be some lending figures and also Nationwide's November price report and the money supply update, which is keeping me very interested at the moment as it helps us towards disinflation. Looking forward to it already. As a parting thought, there seems to be some thought that the election will come in the spring. I couldn't disagree more. As I've said, the likelihood is comparatively, compared to 2022 and 23, things will feel a lot better next year for working middle class Britain. And with Labour only looking at a 20 seat majority when you would expect it was an 80 seat majority last time round, I think it's September 2024. And if I was betting at the current prices, I'd be betting on no overall majority now. But then I'm looking through the economic lens when saying that, not the emotional or the political. Either way, keep calm and carry on. By next week, I will also hopefully have started an advent calendar style bunch of video releases, with the first one on December the 1st. The goal is to take an economic concept every day that relates to property and explain it simply in a 60 second video, and also in a longer form but under 5 minute video for those who want to delve a bit deeper. That's the carrot. The conditions are my YouTube channel getting to 500 subscribers. I'm on 488 before the release of this supplement on the 26th of November, so I should get there, but it might be tight. Make sure to tell everyone you know who might be interested, or might just do what you say, to subscribe to get me over that milestone, please. Thanks for supporting. Please keep spreading the word. It can only lead to more and better content, and that's the aim. And I'll hopefully be talking to you again on the 1st of December.